Wow, lots of people have dropped. Um, yeah. Yeah. Career fair. Huh? Career, career fair? fair. Okay. Um, so, uh, any questions? So remember, this evening is a deadline for you to submit. Uh, is the deadline midnight? Or huh? Is the deadline midnight? Yeah, midnight Pacific time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, I mean, usually these deadlines are more aspirational than reality, but so, uh, it's not like you're going to lose any points or something. If you're, uh, but the point is that's a, that uh, is practical. Uh, any other question? Um, those of you who need sort of, uh, those of you who know that we have to purchase components, stuff like that, even though I've not put up the spreadsheet, you should start uh, gathering that information. And, uh, Kind of the usual details, vendor, uh, making sure it's in stock, things like that. Do some reasonable, for costly parts, do a little bit of diligence into uh, where uh, uh, things are cheaper among the major vendors that you can get into this thing. Um, uh, let's see, the other thing is uh, last time I had, uh, I sent a mail out to this effect. Last time I had said that uh, I may have to cancel Monday's lecture. But then it turned out that uh, to, uh, I hadn't realized that we also needed to cover uh, for the next homework uh, some of the details on the platform. So two of my students, Am and Fatma, they are going to give a lecture. Uh, so it's not simply about the homework. It's going to be about uh, Linux operating system, uh, particularly in its embedded variants, uh, how do you do some of the time-aware type programming in it, in the sense controlling uh, GPIO and things like that, and uh, uh, kind of walk you through the kernel architecture as well as using it on the platform. Now, uh, one person uh, asked me, uh, do, you, do, do you need to purchase BeagleBone? And secondly, uh, could you substitute Raspberry Pi? Uh, so, answer to the second question um, uh, whether you can substitute Raspberry Pi or not is unfortunately no. And the reason is that on BeagleBone, there, is, uh, there are two kind of embedded almost like very low level processors, they're called PRUs, uh, programmable real time units. And they are unique to the pro processor called Setara processor, which uh, TI makes, and which BeagleBone has, but as Raspberry Pi is a uh, cross pump chip, so it doesn't have anything to do with it. In fact, Raspberry Pi processors, there are very few details of the PRU available because Broadcom usually does not hand out the tech piece. So uh, a lot of things about that are essentially like they provide binary device drivers and Raspberry Pi can integrate them in, but uh, as a platform where you want to do low level stuff, it's not uh, amenable to it. Um, so, um, BeagleBone and uh, if, uh, if you go to BeagleBone.org, there are many variants of BeagleBone, some of them are primarily different in. Um, network connectivity, some are wireless, some are ethernet, uh, things like that. Also, the interface for sensor. Uh, we are going to use BeagleBone Black. Now, I did a spot check on prices yesterday. It's 57 bucks. I don't want you guys to pay for it, so I'll do the usual. I'll go to purchase. I think I may have sufficient in my lab to at least provide some, but you are welcome to purchase if you so desire. Um, Oh no, there's no purchase agreement. Oh, purchase okay. is purchase. Uh, you, know, you buy it, sure. Um, I don't want to get into uh, that large scale. So, um, uh, so you can again either borrow from it or buy it. Um, you won't need it uh, for another week and a half or so. Uh, my suggestion is that unless you are really into hardware hacking and all. Really kind of tinkering on, on your own, there's no point in buying. So, uh, let's see. So, if you do decide to buy it, uh, it's even more black, and there are several versions of it uh, corresponding to different provisions. And you can buy the latest one, I think, which is probably Rev C or Rev D. Uh, 
some of the vendors on Amazon and all sell data versions. So yeah, sort of take care of that. Um, you would run a particular operating system, a particular release of the operating system there, one where uh, there are some kernel modules that my lab has written for low level uh, sort of manipulation of uh, some of the hardware, but having to do with timing and the values. So the way it will work is that even if uh, we are not going to sort of load that OS and make this a big bucket policy, where you are going to have to do something to load. Um, basic intent behind uh, the second homework is going to be that you're going to do some simple time critical tasks, basically generating waveforms to represent target certain requirements or and time stamping incrementally, mm -hmm. right? So the task itself is very simple, but you're going to do it purely from the way um, application, uh, an application running under Linux might, uh, which means that running in the user space, any manipulation that you have to do has to be through uh, the operating system because you have um, normally the OS uh, hides uh, or prevents direct manipulation. Um, uh, from the application, but there are kind of you know, features and all that operating systems have um, which let you bypass some of these things. But the basic issue is one of the roles OS plays is to share, let multiple applications share the hardware. So anytime there is any direct access to pin and all, it has to go through the device shell or you are not allowed to write to register directly. Uh, the PRU being a unique feature of the assembly of processor. Uh, so again, we have developed um, some, uh, actually another tour to a project from a year ago, uh, developed a uh, programming language for it, uh, which has some interesting characteristics. Uh, we also developed some tools to let you more easily load programs and also again, our, our release of Linux OS So anyway, uh, a lot of those details will sort of come out uh, you know, later after next Monday um, uh, The other thing is, since um, that, uh, while I have provided all the information to my students to record the lecture, uh, there might be a snafu there, and uh, since they're also going to do some live demos, so the video recording doesn't always work well when someone else is doing it. So attend it because uh, from past experience, the probability of uh, the lecture not being recorded properly is pretty high. So. Okay, so um, uh, we had started on uh, the software development, sort of how that looks like on these platforms and all. And uh, interestingly, one thing you'll find is, uh, so here I kind of have given this picture, you write codes, you know, process this and then run it on download it to your programming device, that's how you did it in Embed. But then on the higher end uh, embedded devices like Beagle Phone and Raspberry Pi, uh, these are kind of reasonably capable, so you can actually do compilation there only. So in fact, um, the compiler for PRU on Beagle Phone is actually on Beagle Phone itself. So they were embedded in there and they were more open for interacting with the browser. So this model uh, really is while very common, it's not always necessarily the case, and many of these devices may have toolkit on board uh, to let you do things. Um, I had also talked about a uh, you know, lot of the uh, language options and all that have emerged. Uh, when it comes to simulation, so um, uh, one very sort of common level approach is that you literally create a very low level uh, model of the processor, which is uh, actually related to the Beagle phone. Uh, there is a there is a view that exists for them, but we necessarily like are we expected to get like everything in Beagle phone that you plug in with Okay, so good point. So uh, uh, Beagle Bone, Raspberry Pi, all of these things are two ways you can operate them. One is that you hook it up to a terminal. Uh, these things are usually based on HDMI or micro HDMI, which uh, you are unlikely to 
have a terminal recently, so I hope it's up to my elevator. Uh, but if you don't have that, either and all, one thing to do is set it once and then do VNC into it, okay? And um, most of the time, actually, after uh, the web page, you can set it to work with that. Um, Beaglebone also has a browser based interface for creating the web page that you can use, okay? In fact, the CI can the compile the tools that we provide for PR you will actually talk about it. Okay. You, if there's a server running on your bone and you know, So there are many different ways and you can always kind of um, if it's a standard on the system, you can uh, download uh, find out tools and all those things that are also okay. Uh, so simulation so uh, one common approach is then you first find a instruction set level simulator for the processor so, so that you can literally execute the same binary. Uh, and uh, uh, naturally it's slow. Uh, I mean think of it this way that um, the, the processor on Raspberry Pi I think is around 1 and a half gigahertz. On BeagleBone I think it's around 800 gigahertz. Um, so these are pretty fast things and if you're running this on a laptop desktop uh, Clock ratio is a factor of two or three, and the area you're trying to emulate the whole processor. So by the time you end up doing it, let's say your effective speed of the processor, uh, if you're lucky, is going to be up to tens of megahertz. So quite slow, but you can boot up the OS and all literally kind of the binary that you would, 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 would have. Um, uh, Cynics, which I mentioned last time, uh, was very about as an example, QMO, uh, which is totally open source. Example. These are uh, QMO is a processor emulator. Uh, Cynix has all this framework where you can hook up devices and all to it and kind of tune the system. But since this is slow, so the other approach which is used is block level simulation, where what you do is uh, 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 take the same code, uh, but it is now uh, uh, compiled, but uh, uh, you compile it for your host process. Um, and then the simulator kind of makes all sorts of attempts to violate one from its cycle accuracy because it can't, um, but it tries to mimic at an API level and uh, you know, the peripherals and all, all the capabilities that it has, and then it provides you as a it uses models to give you estimates of what might be happening. So like for example, the iPhone simulator on uh, Xcode or probably the most likely things are equivalent for those Android. Um, uh, these things are no longer, uh, these things do not generate ARM code and then mimic an ARM processor. Rather, they generate, if you're on a S86, if you're on an Apple uh, they generate that code, but then if you have played with Xcode, it still provides you estimates of how much power consumption will it take, what will be the likely speed, those kind of things. And it does so by having high level macro models of the underlying platform. So you can literally select what would happen if I'm running it on a high power model X, and uh, it will bring in the model from that. And so uh, um, uh, this is old. Android used to be QMO based. I'm pretty sure it's not. Uh, many uh, uh, other simulators, cycle accurate simulators, float around. Uh, yeah, but I think sort of. If, for a lot of things, QMO is a very reasonable thing. In fact, I think uh, one of the projects in this course, up in the future home, we had done an embed simulator using QMO. It wasn't very successful, successfully done, so uh, I don't use it, but you can kind of do that kind of thing. Okay. I think I have also seen high-level simulators of the same flavor where you can just kind of run it um, on your host. In fact, I think I saw it as an app on uh, iOS devices, so you can kind of mimic entire platform. And uh, usually, um, uh, there is a uh, the way you sort of uh, approach programming uh, the low end devices and the high end devices tend to be different, mostly because high end devices usually are running Linux or something much more capable, so you can kind of log in, log in there and uh, kind of do that part. Uh, using SSH and stuff like that, moving files using all the OS and all these things. Uh, 
tinier devices, the separation between operating system and application isn't that much, and due to the, uh, the whole image, and that's what you download, and that is done typically through some sort of a uh, programming interface, JTAG, or serial, or USB, or things like that. Many of these devices require you to have a JTAG thing, certainly if you're the programming uh, low level uh, encoder and all. Um, uh, embed, big, uh, uh, the big reason why embed became so popular and successful is that they defined a very specific interface for downloading the matter and production of the port. So every embed has a tiny little separate processor which manages the extraction and upwards. And the abstraction is that you're plugging it into your port device and then to download a program, you literally just put a file onto that system. And that little processor, the interface processor running on any embed compliant board basically monitors the flat file system and the moment they see uh, something in the binary, moves it to the actual processor. And so it hides all those programming details and all and makes it unnecessary uh, for it once you have a JTAG uh, program or anything like that. So it just made the whole process uh, super convenient. I mentioned bootloader. So all, all these devices, and even your laptops and computers and all, um, uh, there is, uh, uh, when the processor like, resets, the very first thing it goes to is the boot order. And uh, in PC world, we call it BIOS. So all the parallel BIOS, BIOS is another issue. Um, the, uh, there are some standard stuff out there. Uh, um, even for these tiny devices, um, but for real tiny stuff, usually you are in full control, right? From that instruction number one. Uh, but uh, for embed, for example, there is a specific bootloader that embed requires uh, for that whole process to work out. So when you purchase an embed compliant board, uh, it may either come loaded with the embed stuff, or oftentimes it's also possible that you may have to kind of put in that. Uh, and that requires like to plug into the boot um, uh, uh, Likewise, uh, um, when it comes to the 32 bit type stuff, uh, particularly uh, Raspberry Pi or uh, Google Phone and all, uh, if you have to install a new OS, you have to run that through the boot. Right? But once that is taken care of, then a subsequent working for it becomes a lot easier. Uh, so the sequence is bootloader boots up. Make sets things up. It offers uh, uh, kind of a, uh, some sort of a higher level abstraction, uh, often called as HAL, hardware abstraction layer, so that the operating systems can be written to a, uh, instead of knowing about all the nitty gritty, they can kind of deal, it, deal with it at a higher level, and then the control passes to the operating system. Um, uh, you may hear these things like EFI, UEFI, or a whole bunch of these. Um, sort of bootloader software, or, and there are companies which just sort of specialize, specialize in that, and they can hide all, all, all these details. Uh, um, uh, let's see. And usually, uh, in many cases, uh, uh, for shipping devices and all, they may even lock the bootloader because that's the one part of the code that you can trust. One of the issues which increasingly is coming up in IoT devices is that uh, uh, yeah, it's the whole issue of security. You've deployed something out there, and uh, what can you trust in the sense that is there any piece of software which, uh, which, which uh, you can trust is non-compromisable? Um, and one of the things uh, which is also done is that the very beginning bootloader, uh, standard practice is we just make it hard to read from it, okay? Uh, what I mean by that is that you may need a JTAG unit or something like that, but for any uh, technical person, it's not much of a barrier, but at least casual reprogramming, it's not going to make it easy. And certainly, you cannot reprogram it through a network access. So you, uh, so you have to kind of physically access it. Uh, but even that is not sufficient for many IoT devices. So uh, in that case, you either lock the bootloader, and it's done one of two ways. One is that for large volumes, companies like TI and all will happily uh, make a version of the chip where your program is burnt into ROM. Okay, and that and then send the part, that's what it is. Or alternatively, uh, it would have a 
flash or if wrong or something like that, you try to it, and then you burn a fuse to disable further flight. But if you're doing it, you have to be absolutely sure that you are never going to have to change it because uh, once you lock it, you lock it. Um, so, uh, so that beginning part, and in fact, it turns out that if your system has two properties, uh, one, some sort of a unique ID, which can't be spoofed, uh, and there are ways to do this thing. And secondly, uh, some program which can work with that unique ID and which cannot be interrupted. So using that, you can build up a whole subject of your system stack on top of it. If you don't have that, then someone will associate access to essentially hack, hack the device. So uh, in light of the fact that now it's becoming quite prevalent that uh, interconnected internet connected devices are being remotely hacked into and then made part of botnets and all there's a lot of procedures. But even for these simple devices, what how could we make sure that they don't get compromised? Someone doesn't go around, pick them up, reprogram it using uh, data units and suddenly security system is not working So yeah, traditionally worried worried about it, but uh, increasingly a concern. Um, testing and debugging was obviously looks quite different, particularly when you're working on the lower end devices where there's no screen. So if it's Raspberry Pi and Dual Bone and all, works come to work, you can always uh, you know, hook them up and kick off them at the slow level of computer. Uh, but for a lot of other stuff, your friends are going to be things like uh, LEDs and signals on the DPIO pins and you hook up a uh, or some scope and all, or alternatively, you create some sort of an I/O channel. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that you know, while these programming environments may provide you with functions like print test and all, uh, they come at a huge cost. They're extremely slow, and um, uh, so something that may actually disturb the characteristics of the program that you're writing. Um, uh, but they do exist, and you can use them carefully. Want. Uh, they are usually, they in turn lock some communication channels. So whenever you use those print tips and all, essentially as part of your development code, uh, it's always kind of uh, risky. So usually uh, better is to rely on um, uh, physical IOs and all and or storing some status bit and some shared memory area and looking at it from the other side. Uh, if you are working in an industrial setting, then there are tools called in-circuit emulators, which can kind of in-circuit emulators and also sort of through the JTAG ports, you can freeze the processor at a clock cycle, examine all the registers, change some registers, restart them. Uh, so uh, there are these kind of things available. They just a cost a lot more than what you know the kind of setting you can sort of work with. Uh, and B, they're complex to use, so, uh, so it's not something that you would find in a uh, typical uh, academic or hobby uh, sort of setting. But those things do exist as well. Um, okay, so then becomes a question, how do you organize the software on the And uh, since they interact with the outside world, uh, primarily you end up dealing with a couple of ways of interacting. One is that you have your sort of some periodic measurements of samples are coming, or maybe you are sampling the data. Uh, so periodic stuff is very common. Another one is events. That is, the systems uh, often uh, sort of have to deal with that there are asynchronous things happening. Even um, sometimes your sensor itself may be asynchronous, like it may be. Uh, bump sensor on a robot, which will send something only when something happens. So it is intrinsically a form of an asynchronous event, uh, or a request coming over a network or things like that. Uh, and in other cases, it may be that your low-level sensor monitor uh, is doing some thresholding on that periodic time series. So your periodic time series after some processing, you can see this becomes an asynchronous time series. So at some level, you would see that these are systems. Uh, 
uh, begin to have a very preventable characteristic, kind of like the way you write these programs or uh, test servers or things like that, which is some arrival of preventable in a certain manner, and uh, you still want to be able to handle the data and all. So uh, fundamental um, out here is that you have to be prepared to uh, handle these events in some arbitrary arrival order, uh, not predictable. So while you are waiting for an event, uh, waiting for events, they can arrive in any order. So one might way would be that I keep rapidly checking them in some sequence, or is it this event and this event, and just not go back and check again, or alternatively, I can design the system so that I can uh, somehow either with OS or hardware assist, I can basically wait in an interrupt like manner. So very hardware is intrinsically designed like that. You have multiple sources of interrupts. The hardware in parallel is waiting for any of them to arrive, and then one of them comes, it's gonna wake up the hardware process. Operating systems through appropriate commands kind of give you the same so there are ways in which you can specify even uh, on, on things like Linux and OS and so on, where you say, I'm waiting for something, one of these things to happen, and if any one of them happens, wake me up, and then uh, I'm going on. Some other operating systems are designed in a manner of event handling. So what you do is you tell the OS, if this event comes, call this function. If this event comes, call this function, and so it goes on. And then you sort of go away. So anyone from like any uh, minutes, let's say, uh, you know how to wait for events on an arbitrary set of devices, more than one device, and whichever one uh, has something for you, uh, you return and then you work with that. Yeah, select and poll. So these are sort of two functions which uh, let you do that. Um, so that's an example where uh, you are telling the OS that here is a set of devices I'm interested in. Whenever one of them has an event, wake me up and then I will call it. The other model is I attach a function to it. So I tell the operating system that when this event happens, call this function. And this function, and, and likewise I may do it for other things, and this function will share to a common memory space something with other elements of the program. And then in the subset, I can kind of observe that. So if any of you have used Node.js, for example, that's just the programming style it follows. Even in Linux and Unix, there are ways you can uh, arrange for uh, doing asynchronous so what I mean by that is, uh, so normally when you do a I/O Unix, you have one of two options. One is you say do an I/O action, write write something to a device, and then the OS will return only when it has succeeded. So it calls. Is it? What what does this kind of thing have to do? Blocking I/O. So I'm blocked until it succeeds, and it works great for general purpose systems because while I'm blocked, while my process is blocked, the OS will give the CPU to the right? So it's still able to make these efficient decisions. Uh, another uh, easy option you can do is you can say, uh, yeah, but you know, it's possible that a device has gone bad and all, so I'm going to do a time, uh, time So I'll say, write to this device, but don't wait for more than a certain period of time. Okay, so this is called blocking IO, but there's a time But there is another set of much less used ways of doing I.O. in Unix, uh, which is asynchronous I.O. And where what you basically say is the following, that uh, write this thing, return immediately, and when you are done with the I.O., then send me an interrupt. And I will attach a function to, to respond to that interrupt. And that interrupt uh, at the software level is called Signals are how operating systems send asynchronous events to uh, uh, to a process in this system. Okay, so you can attach a signal handler. Okay, so the idea would be I'll make an I/O request, 
um, when it, uh, so let's say it'll read, read the next thing from a bubble, okay, uh, or a device, and but I'll tell the OS that the asynchronous read will return immediately, and then uh, uh, when the OS has actually grabbed the amount of data, then it will send a signal, and then I'll have a handler attached to the signal, and uh, that handler will uh, interact with the rest of my code to some shared data stream. So there are all these different ways you can kind of organize this thing, and fundamentally it can, can boil down to dealing with concurrency, right? I mean, many things happening. I don't know the order in which they happen. I would like to have the illusion of concurrence, uh, like I just can handle anything in whatever order it's happening. And uh, either through the OS or through some library, you are uh, going to uh, yeah, uh, orchestrate a bucket system. So one common way to handle this stuff is uh, using threads, and the other is to use events of the other threads. Uh, so uh, in multi-threaded software, uh, you organize things as multiple threads. What that literally mean, uh, means is it's as if I have multiple software components, each one of them has the illusion of having running on its own hardware, kind of in parallel, re reality in parallel, and then the processor, I may have fewer processors than threads, oftentimes it's a single processor, and the OS kind of rapidly, or uh, you know, some policy kind of multiplex the system as and as needed. Uh, threads, processing, these are kind of the but main thing is usually within a single application, threads are part of a single application. Whereas, so, so there are multiple things running in parallel, um, yeah, but that's all sharing a common application. Whereas when you have processes, then they are all residing in isolated applications. Now it turns out in Linux, that separation isn't really there. In Linux, when you, everything is a thread, that's in the operating system, and it's just that some threads have their own address space, other threads share it. Um, so, in, in a way, now what's happening is a kernel, which is where kind of all that multiplexing hardware going on, and your system is organized with these multiple threads, and at some appropriate point in time, it is going to make some request to the kernel or wait for something from the kernel at all. But within each thread, you have the, uh, your, 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 it's as if you have a sequential processor, process, and, uh, uh, and these things are running in parallel. Uh, it's great um, uh, in terms of simplicity of programming in one way because then really you say I'm not having to worry about parallelism and stuff like that. But then I do have to think in terms of how these threads interact with each other. Uh, I have to realize that I may be bumped off from the CPU. Uh, I may have to wait for something. All those kinds of things. So there are um, yeah, a very uh, uh, usually there would be something like select or pull or wait that I would wait for something to become available and I'll block until the OS does that. So it could be like, for example, maybe the first thread has to send some data to the second thread, so at some point the second thread is going to read the data, but it's not there, uh, so it will wait until the first thread puts it into the front of a queue and then the second thread will read it. So, um, so uh, you can do this thing in a Linux type operating system, you can do some these things at the level of a process, or you can do these things at the level of threads within a process. In an operating system like Android, there are similar other ways for these things to sort of communicate with each other. So every OS has, would offer some exceptions. Cons are that all this stuff of managing these independent address spaces, all these kind of stuff and all can uh, sort of complicate things quite a bit. Um, uh, each thread would need its own stack. So in memory challenged uh, devices, that can be a problem. So while uh, there are threaded operating systems at all available even for the tiny of 8-bit devices, if you have only like 10K of RAM and you have a, sort of a stack there, and now instead of a single stack and everything is working off that stack, you have to now say, hey, I have five threads, I need to now divide up the stack into five little stacks somehow. And I have to estimate up front. And all. So it's, it's resource challenge setting, that's an issue. And moreover, 
precisely in those resources challenge setting, there are no protections in memory. That is, if I have two stacks sitting in memory, if one for whatever reason overflows, it can just crash the other thing. Whereas a regular computer, they will build up its own, uh, you, can, you can make use of memory management uh, capabilities of the processor to at least be able to avoid it. Uh, so sets are um, kind of heavier weight, but uh, many cases uh, find it easier to work with. Um, so they are uh, sort of a good counterpoint to um, the event driven approach where what happens is that I tell the kernel that for this event, this is the function to call. For a different event, this is a different function to call. And then I go away, perhaps the uh, sort of event uh, just spins away nothing. Uh, these handlers are nothing but pure functions. So what I mean by that is that uh, when the kernel will have some sort of a queue of events, it will call this kind of if the event corresponding to the top handler comes, it will call the top handler. Sometime later, or let's say the next event within the queue is the one for third handler, the third handler will get called. You know? The thing is, these handlers, when I pass control to them, they can only return at the end. In between, they cannot do anything like, oh, I'm waiting for something. Okay, so they are just pointing. Which basically means I need a single stack because handlers themselves are being run atomically. So, I make a, so kernel makes a call to this handler, it exits, and the next handler, and so on. And these handlers can have state. So they may have variables that are somewhere in, in the memory, so that from one invocation of the handler to the next invocation, it can remember stuff. So like it can count how many times that event has arrived, and then take some. So uh, they are functions plus a state. Okay? And uh, the other thing is these handlers can talk to each other uh, through some areas of memory which they all have access to. So this is where yeah, this is uh, this is how um, like not not JS is an example, but uh, uh, like if you write signal handlers in C or uh, actually on embed, you can do this. You literally do do this style of programming, or actually you can program in Arduino and all a simpler embedded system which don't have a threaded operating system usually. Provide some extra uh, yeah, thing to keep in mind is that if this handler is goes further, like for example, it puts in an infinite loop there. So, okay, yeah, you're stuck. So this the usual idea is that a handler should take small amount of time and come out. Okay, and uh, uh, no, uh, they should not. Uh, they cannot escape back to the OS in the middle. They literally just have to. Uh, the thing which uh, so first thing many people find this thing easier. Usually, what I have realized is that electrical engineers find this thing easier because this is closer to the way hardware works at the lower level. So easier, to, closer to the kind of things that you are doing in the chip and all. Uh, on the other hand, the order in which these handlers are getting called is totally arbitrary. It's driven by the way the events arrive. So it makes uh, so people who come from the programming side. You know, But uh, there are papers galore in computer science which is on this issue of events versus state. Events are better, threads are evil, these sort of things. And we see from sort of, uh, some of the top uh, work these kind of things. And um, uh, to this date, sort of management of concurrency and all remains an issue because you find it in so many places. In web, you see it in web servers, and you see it in GUI systems, and you see it in embedded systems. Um, Google has this new language a few years ago called Go. Have you heard of it? Go? No? Okay. Played with it ever? No. Did you program it no. ever? No. Okay. So Go was like C with concurrency and some other stuff, but the main thing that Go introduced was uh, a lightweight form of threads uh, which have efficiencies comparable to handlers, and I'll tell you how sort of they work. Um, uh, and, and yet, that fraction of a thread. And um, so, so Go has been pitched by Google with some valid reasons as uh, you know, a modern language for handling concurrency. Uh, thing to bear in mind is that concurrency and parallelism are different things, okay? So often might be confused. Uh, 
uh, parallelism is literally means I do have multiple resources and I'm sort of doing stuff in parallel, right? There could be multiple arithmetic units inside the GPU or multiple cores and stuff like that. Uh, on the other hand, concurrency is really multiple things going on uh, together, perhaps interleaved in some order, but so it's almost like I have to multitask and then do multiple things, wait for this event and wait for this event. Um, and a lot of even simple, simple devices have that characteristic. Think of like a phone. The phone has to simultaneously wait for possibly a human picking up the handset, uh, or whatever, press the on button, uh, and a call arriving, right? Or there are two things going on. And they can happen in any order unpredictably. Uh, so that's the characteristic which makes concurrency kind of interesting and also tends to cause lots and lots of problems because. If you don't design it properly, you run into these things like deadlock, live lock. The deadlock meaning I'm waiting, I, I get the system that stalls because one party is waiting for something, another party is waiting for another thing, and there's some sort of a uh, conflict happening there where you, none of them is able to, uh, can move forward and there's no resolution to that. Uh, live lock is everyone is running, but really no work is getting done. Uh, and there are other such. Settings. So things can go awry very easily if you're not careful about it. And reasoning about the correctness of these kind of systems is pretty, uh, pretty tricky and makes makes things uh, sort of hard. So uh, this slide kind of captures that uh, in thread within each thread you have a nice sequence of flow, except that at certain points you are going to wait for something to happen. Well, in case of event. Uh, these handlers are going to get called in some order, which is entirely determined by uh, the sequence in which the events happen to arrive in that particular run. So it's a bit more spaghetti like out here, but if you think about it, this is like how in this case the things work. One way, the reason I said that EEs, I generally found that have a better way of working, uh, handling the thing is if you think of like when we design finite state machines and better law and DHP and things like that, that's really what's happening. In each state, um, kind of conceptually, the state is triggered by a driving event. When the state executes, so both the state executes, it in turn generates additional events. And then that triggers successive states or both of the events. So this is literally kind of a software uh, way of expressing a standard. Whereas we don't think of controllers and chips and all in terms of multi threaded way of expressing that. Um, even though at some level you can do anything one way or another, you can do three in a row and that is fine. So uh, for uh, low, end uh, low end devices, a very common model is that you don't have a or you don't have a very clear, well-defined OS. It gives you some pointers and all, and your application will make use of it, and uh, you're going to take a binary, and that binary just takes care of a problem. Now, having said, that's how, like, uh, uh, one of the ways you can work with your application. But having said that, as our processors have gotten more powerful, as well as um, uh, sort of there is, uh, uh, we, we still need Things that we can reuse across uh, things so across different uh, uh, systems. So uh, even in the low end and mid systems, you would see reasonable operating systems have emerged. Uh, embed OS is one example, but there are others. There's one which is very commonly used called FreeRTOS, which is available for a lot of these low end devices, and there are a few others like that. Um, and most of them. Uh, event driven at the low end, but many of them do offer threaded driven events. But with all these caveats that I mentioned, which is uh, you have to figure out how to, if you have very little memory on that processor, how do you do these things? Also, I guess generally speaking, I would say why you can run a threaded stuff even on tiny 8-bit microcontrollers with 10 kilobytes of RAM, uh, it's probably not going to take you very far. Uh, and you probably will have to kind of go to and drill down for it. On the other hand, some of our low-end devices now are, have, let's say, uh, 
uh, hundreds of kilobytes or perhaps a few megabyte size RAM, uh, you can begin to do certain stuff. So the software along the way, there is Um, some examples, tiny OS, this was an OS out of uh, UC Berkeley, which became extremely popular in the space of wireless sensors. So you have uh, microcontrollers with radio and sensors and all. And that was an example of event driven thing. And uh, you would program it, you generate the whole binary, you need to change something, you decompile the thing, you would generate a new binary. So it's Application OS, everything kind of rolled into a single application which is often used as far as firmware. Conticky is out of Europe and extremely popular. In fact, Tiny OS used to be the same space, and Tiny OS used to be very popular, and I think gradually Tiny OS faded away. I think to say maybe some time it was used it. Conticky is still very popular, and there are some companies out of Europe which use it very regularly. Uh, this too is event driven under the hood. Uh, uh, it has binary modularity. So what I mean by that is, in a running Conticky system, I can replace a part of the system without destroying anything else. But I mean, this we take for granted in a in Linux and this kind of thing. I can always mount a new program and run it, right? But in in those tiny devices, it's pretty hard because remember, all the applications are sharing kind of a shared address space, and also if I change one function and you know, all, I may usually lack. So we have to recompile the whole thing and not change stuff. But Conticky does some tricky stuff to kind of make that happen. Embed operating system, embed OS 5, uh, provides uh, threaded abstraction, free RSOS addition. Uh, this one is kind of really nice in the sense that there's a whole text, textbook which literally you know, walks you through the whole OS. So it's a great, uh, you know, so you learn about how. A reasonably good operating system is or, uh, embedded OS is organized. And then at the higher end, that is, the higher end I mean 32 bit size embedded processors and all. So while you can always run Linux, and that's probably the most popular stuff, but for many applications, uh, there are operating systems with uh, more finely tuned for embedded processors and all. And there are a couple which are very popularly used. One is called VxWorks. You'll find it in NASA uses a lot and all. It is reasonably kind of uh, uh, critical in terms of uh, performance and uh, requirements and all. So VxWorks. QNX uh, is another one, um, uh, which is kind of out there. Um, but in most cases, uh, it's some variant of Linux, particularly since Linux now has real time kind of capability. While it is not as real time performance as the Xbox and all might be, but it's good enough. And at the same time, you benefit from a whole bunch of networking and user experience uh, capability that is uh, quite possible. Uh, there is also a version of Rapid Linux called MicroQLinux, and the main thing is that it can work without a memory management unit. What all does a memory management unit do in a process? No, you don't need memory management units for that. You can imagine that all these things will take care of form of memory. And you have some processing power. Maybe you can map it to DRAM or something. Maybe you can map it to DRAM or something. Okay, so one thing it does is virtual memory. What's virtual memory? That's what it is. So what is virtual memory? Want to give an unusual or larger amount of things, so I can print this as a kind of a network. So it's not uh, so right on all that. What else? What else? Like it's basically takes care of needing a virtual address space in order to serve it. So what does virtual address mean? Aside from grid 
Asian Gap region is also um, divided into countries which is going to be Okay. So let's see things. Uh, so I think I said the I guess I'm going to the United States. So one thing is the way that I every process gets the illusion of its own existence. As if it has full visibility into it, it's running on a computer with address going from zero to one. Okay? And in fact, operating systems arrange for uh, to define what goes in the different parts of this virtual address space. Okay? So like it may say, like on Linux, the kernel is visible at a fixed location. The kernel for what it is a visible fixed part of that kernel. A process, every process is stacked will start from the same address in its respective virtual address space. So we can put the code in the same if so every process sees a similar view, except that obviously contents are different, but the kernel part is okay. So they all see some particular address range, which is okay. So now remember, this is not how things internally are going to be. Yeah, some physical memory is going from some address. So somehow this virtual memory has to be mapped. So, of course, one possible scenario is I have a huge amount of physical memory, much larger than my virtual memory, and I can fit all these virtual address spaces. Never the case. Um, and of course, as you can see, kernel appears in all these address spaces. So that's shared. The portions of these virtual memory may be shared, so that is then mapped to the same thing. So the other thing, therefore, that we have in human beings is that they're mapping virtual memory into physical memory. And then you end up with the issue that my physical memory may be smaller. So not every part of the virtual memory may be residing in the physical. And therefore, uh, through uh, you know, I/O with some other storage like flash or disk or whatnot, I can move back and forth, which is, which is sort of called page form. When I try to access an address in virtual memory, I see it's not present in the physical memory, and I go and call some part of the Linux can always find it. So that's the second thing. And third thing is protection. That is, for every page of the memory, uh, I can. Uh, OS can define attributes for it. Is it readable, writable, executable? Who can do it? Okay. And again, those of you who are in uh, seminars uh, like Michael Brand, uh, he's gone over some of these issues. Like uh, uh, it used to be that pages which held data were going to be used to be more executable. But that led to all these attacks where somehow the adversary would, by trashing your stack, would get caught there and then say jump to it. Stopping all well, that was okay, so um, the stack should not reside in a memory page which is writable and executable both. So you should not have this sort of write and execute and things like this. So you can have uh, protection, and this also obviously leads to that like, who can do it, right? So maybe some pages are readable by other processes, others are not. So uh, this capability of MMU provides. An interesting way to give applications access to hardware resources. So normally, when you try a, a hardware device on a processor, is nothing but at some level is going to be some registers that you are going to be reading and writing to at some physical address location. And normally, to prevent applications from directly manipulating it in operating systems like Linux and all, you will always Open a device, close the device, and then go through some API, and then the OS under the hood takes your read request and maps it. So that means if I need to toggle a pin, there's a device driver which, through some API, lets me toggle a pin. Manage the pin, and I'll say pin number A1, you change the pin. But that's extremely slow because every time I'm, uh, what I'm doing is I'm making a call to the operating system. Interrupt or trap going to the operating system, context switch happens, all of this stuff goes on. This is simply simple. But for trusted process, what the OS can do is it can say, you know, that part of the address uh, space, physical address space where the device is located, I want to make it visible on this process's virtual address space. So manually, uh, the register corresponding to this entity's converter is now mapped to a 
particular region of that particular trusted processing at this state, and now it can read and write. So the OS is going to read this process. So one of the ways as you approach um, Even more assignments, you'll see that these are kind of ideas that you can do it. You can either always go through this custom policy thread, which is pretty slow, or you can do what is called a descent map, the mean mapping, that is, and have physical resources mapped to a virtualized, to a virtualized space, but then your process has to be a trusted process. That means that you require you know, access to the You won't have an application on its own, cannot map a hardware process to a hardware appropriate process. So this virtual memory management makes a lot of interesting scenarios happen. Unfortunately, if you look at implementations of memory maps, they are more complicated than your drawing problem. Okay, doing a lot of stuff. So you don't find memory management in drawing problems. Uh, uh, certainly not in your microcontrollers, but even some of the primitive processors don't have no memory mapping. And therefore, all these goodies that we're talking about uh, have to be done. Uh, Do you have any like memory processing specific tools for uh, What do you mean, memory processing specific tools? Like, we don't have the, if we don't have, we would have like the, oh no, never mind, never mind. Like, so, there are two levels of trust that one has to worry about. You want to make sure. OS is protected. Application should not be able to trash the OS and any resources managed by OS. And that is handled by the process having two modes. Uh, I mean, the concept is called protection ring. So you will hear this term ring one, ring two, ring three, and ring four. So at least you will have two. There is one where the OS runs and one where the applications run, all applications. Okay? And uh, the OS can, you can always go from a higher level protection scheme, uh, sorry, more protected uh, ring to a less protected ring, but the reverse direction would always require that you make a request, and then the entity in the more protected ring is going to validate and let you in. So, for example, whenever you make these calls in a program, like open a file or something like that, what's happening deep down is that a request is being made to OS and that is done through a software intro and then the OS validates it. The permission, not your permission, the delegation. So you can go uh, a high level entity can always lower its limit but not the other way. Okay, so then the other issue is how do different applications in that lower level uh, are protected against each other? And that is done through the memory map. That is proxies of ideas and So uh, these uh, higher end operating systems uh, would provide all these kind of capabilities because now they're running on soft asserts which have memory management created at all, but we, if they don't, they are burdened to like let us deploy them in memory. Um, Android is, as you know, built on top of Linux. So Android is uh, nothing but Linux with a bunch of specialized processes, which is what the Android operating system is. These are privileged processes which are kind of running up, uh, running, running on top of the OS of everything. And uh, iOS also has a Unix core deep down, uh, but a different you know, privileged machines. So, in one of the lectures, I'll have uh, one of my students also go over Android. Um, embed, you guys have already played with, so I will not spend time on it other than to say that when embed originally sort of came out, um, uh, it really was an event driven approach. So kind of the whole model was that you were writing handlers for events. And then the embed print systems at the time was nothing but one which would monitor uh, you know, there was a very thin library of functions which would let which would map hardware events to software visible events. So like for example, you could say every time a character comes on the UR, I want this function to be called, stuff like that. So the abstraction was basically like 
different kinds of things. Um, and uh, so there was really no meaningful OS other than this event dispatching uh, kind of stuff. So uh, uh, the abstraction then used to become, uh, and it's the same thing you would see in Arduino also, that you will usually write, there will be some way you can set up the things, and then you basically give control to the system software, and all that system software is doing is, uh, it's going to call your callback functions depending upon which event is happening, okay? So there is no, so the final statement as far as your application would be concerned would be some sort of go into a loop and wait for events thing. So embed has, um, uh, the, the other thing that I mentioned embed was about this uh, particular way of downloading a program to it and how they define kind of all the APIs and all. So there are many hardware vendors which kind of provide that. Then what happened, uh, maybe three or four years ago, uh, as uh, a community built around embed and as processors became more powerful and all, then ARM got into the game, okay? So embed originally had come out of a company uh, called NXP, which used to be a part of Philips long ago and so kind of long heritage, but at some stage ARM kind of took it over and now suddenly you have ARM OS and stuff like that. They introduced threading stuff. So, so now you can use embed with a more complicated usage model also, one where you have threads and stacks and all those kind of things. So, um, uh, so under the hood, there is that low level layer and then on top of it, you have sort of all sort of goodies built on top of it, including kind of the whole, whole OS. So uh, structurally, then the way uh, they have organized this thing is that, um, so, so uh, backing up, one of the things about ARM is that there is no such thing as a single ARM processor. ARM is a processor core and then all sort of manufacturers make things using that core. So a particular chip you may buy may look quite different than another chip and all sorts of things like that. So the way they kind of handle all this stuff is that they have a lower level stack which basically takes care of that platform stuff to detail. And then once you have this abstraction API, how the abstraction is there, uh, then above that is kind of the part of embed which is agnostic to the specific board or So all of those details are kind of taken care of for you. Uh, one of the things that uh, they also sort of enforce through the compiler on is that a particular layout of the menu. So what happens, where, where do things go and all. So all those stuff which normally if you were doing your own embedded programming, you would have some flexibility. In this particular case, they divide up the address tree and they put specific things at specific uh, places and that goes into all of that is dictated by and um, sort of on the embedded CPA and embedded system, and then um, the compiler, when it links in the modules in the module, basically obeys that. Um, Uh, the operating system itself, and this is a generic view of perhaps almost any OS that provides some thread, we are talking about like that. So you have these threads which you want the CPU to be shared across. So threads are nothing but the data structure, which the operating system manages. And at any given point in time, At most one thread can run, assuming my processor has a single processor code. If it has k processor code, then k threads can run. At any given point in time, so there would be, so assuming a single processor code, one thread would be running. And if there is no thread ready to run, then the OS would be the thread. Uh, aren't there like GPUs, like 520 threads or like tons of threads? Uh, GPUs usually do not have an operating system on them. Isn't there, there's something with like just like the multi-threaded architecture. Like, I don't know what it is, but I've just heard it before. Like, how does it manage all this threat? 
Right. So, so you refer to so, no, 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 no. So, so GPU has conceptual view of GPU is lots of tiny little problems. So just specialized And we So GPU is what is called as single processor. Right? Single instruction, multiple data. So I have a single program which is acting upon multiple data streams. Whereas the kind of thread we're talking about are each thread is different, a different program, and they're operating on different data sets. So that's what you can think of as um, memory, except that that's not really what's happening here because we're running on the same processor, but we have the illusion of memory. Right? Um, so GPUs are single program. Multiple copies of them running on different types of data sets. And that was great for things like matrix, et cetera, operation channel, because it was doing different things. Here I have multiple threads, they are different programs, and at different points in time, some is ready to run, some is not. Um, I just made a statement like I could it could be the case that no thread is ready to run. When would you give me an example of when that might happen? Like, why would it ever be the case that there's nothing to run in the whole thing? Nothing is An external event will happen. Yeah. Uh, so, so usually what happens is an external event happens that will activate some thread or a handle. And then this guy in turn will generate internal event which will activate some other threads and all the same threads. And after that, the activity will die down and then you again get. So that's a very common paradigm. And, uh, I don't know if all operating systems have this, but some of the art tells me that you just have an item that, that you're not doing anything. Can we pass that code to that? Yeah, can we pass that? So we can. Can you define also what the technology is like? You know, so that the CPU always uses uh, the extension of the code to do the uh, uh, Maximum number uh, that is to the CPU always at on the port, yeah. uh, uh, not necessarily because for reasons of power and all, you may not want to. So if it could be that you know you know the load is pretty low given your on this thread, why uh, why activate the port? So that would tie with what those threads are doing and what the power management strategy is. If I can keep the thread happy in terms of performance, even with a single port, so be it. So uh, and then you'll also hear these terms like. Um, uh, Hyperthreaded CPU is something that Intel uses a lot, and that has to do with the fact that modern processors have very deep pipelines. So oftentimes you can run two threads in parallel, hiding behind each other. Right? I mean, for getting data from memory takes time, or sometimes it takes time. So you kind of literally shuffling back and forth between two threads to get it running in parallel, uh, in multiple instances. So, like you would see these things like. CPU has four cores and it has eight virtual cores. Um, these four zeros in a thread match single CD cores. So how many virtual cores? So the virtual core is very related to the fact that a single core, because of hyper threading, can act as more cores, usually two cores or maybe four. Um, so uh, the job of the operating system is then something is running. At some point in time, uh, it will take some action which causes it to wait. Needs something, or maybe it's time is up. So then, at that point in time, uh, it will transition into a waiting state. It's waiting for something, and uh, then what the CPU will do is uh, it will go and look for the next after <coughs> uh, next thread which is ready to run. So there is a queue where threads which now have all the resources to run, they are waiting. And what the OS does is every time. The currently running thread gives up the CPU and goes to the queue, takes two steps with some policy, takes the next thread, and then the next um, And then, of course, threads can die or be killed and all, so that makes it sort of a zombie state. Uh, but basically, they're sort of shuffling between them. When they're running, uh, there might be a time when, uh, uh, when they are uh, not have to, 
wait for some resource. That resource may be something which comes from external, like a character on a UR, or it could be that comes from another thread, like uh, one thread is computing something and something is the next thread. Or it can come from within the OS, timers. So uh, timers are a very common way where I can arrange for an event to be sent to me at a future time. I can say, sleep for 10 seconds. So what's happening under the hood is I'm telling the OS that uh, tell the timer to generate an event 10 seconds from now, and then and I'm, I'm going to wait on that event, and then you know, um, you know, so the variety of these is, but essentially kind of this is the life of a thread and embed art, embed OS is organized in the same way. And anytime you have multiple threads, then you run into these issues like what if they are trying to access the same resource, then you your memory, same data structure, so then you need that evidence to so there are special uh, abstractions that OS will provide to deal with this. One very common one is called mutex, which is kind of like a lock. Uh, uh, a thread needs a resource, so it locks the resource, and then when it's done, it unlocks the resource, and while the resource is locked, no one else can make use of it. And it, there, are, there are a lot of subtleties in this thing, which Look at in a later lecture. Uh, some of you might have seen it in your OS classes, but uh, main thing is that sometimes even the processor has to provide a hardware resource, a hardware, special hardware instruction to make these kind of things happen. So, mutex is very low level stuff. There are things like semaphores, which basically say, you know, here is this resource which at any time only a certain number of threads can use. So, the limit of the count is usually built on top of mutex. And then there are things like queues, uh, sorry, uh, where one thread can send a message to another one, and again it has to be done in a reliable manner because, for example, if a queue is full, we want this thread to wait for that. So it's sort of expected behavior uh, to happen. And then usually these queues are organized as a ring buffer, so you want to make sure that the queue is not scratching the thing. So the uh, that the signals you know, that get is software. And so these are things that Embed provides, but in any operating system which has threads, um, uh, whether the whole OS is threaded or whether it is threads inside a process in Linux, you would see equivalent functionality of some form. Okay, I mean, they may not be exactly this, but some variant of these uh, will exist. Uh, in Embed OS, there is also a mail queue. Uh, which I don't remember what it precisely does. Um, there is timers, so you can arrange for timers to be done. So the advantage of uh, using timers is that um, while you are waiting for the timer event, someone else can use the CPU. On the other hand, if you just busy wait, spin on an instruction, do knob counting and all, then you're not giving up the CPU, which is bad for power, bad for overall performance. Um, and then finally, um, um, what these operating systems, uh, these kind of OSs provide is and usually an ability to write interrupt handlers. So you can write very low level stuff where you specify a function which needs to be called when an interrupt happens. Now usually what happens is in this particular case is that there is still the lowest level of interrupt handling is where registers are saved for the current process and all uh, currently running threads. Those are taken care of by the System and then after it has done that, then it is going to call you. Okay, so uh, there are these special functions you can designate that this is an interrupt service protein, and then the compiler would arrange for all that stuff to be done so that it can safely run inside from from within the resource. Because remember, interrupts can come at arbitrary points in time uh, when some other code is running, so you don't know anything about uh, the state of register. That you have to preserve everything before you can do any execution. So the interrupt handlers are always there. So again, in case of embed, uh, all of that uh, is taken care of by the OS. And uh, yeah, I don't know why I have this slide. So uh, to summarize kind of this uh, broad look at embedded platform, um, uh, I guess. The key takeaways I would say the following there are some distinctive parts to these, but they all kind of 
work in orchestration and uh, processor obviously plays a very important role, but as we also saw sensors, actuators, uh, uh, processing subsystem, all these sort of things are very important. Um, yeah, sorry, power subsystem, they're important. Additionally, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that I didn't talk about. Like for example, many of these devices would have some way of human interaction, for example. So there are other, other things that exist as well that one needs to worry about. So before I switch over to the next slide set, let's take a few minutes break. If you have any questions, you can sort of talk to me. So five minutes. Okay, let's restart. Um, so uh, this next uh, module, I want to go deeper into uh, different ways the software can be organized. Um, so a little bit, and we can dive into what's going on. Um, want to do a walkthrough into uh, into this issue a little bit a uh, little bit more so uh, I already mentioned that uh, that the two kinds of workloads that uh, you encounter in embedded systems one which is periodic uh, usually it's a result of sampling some sort of a sensor um, and uh, it may be also periodic because I have to many actuators I need to write periodically. And I think I think the driver behind a lot of this is that a lot of relevant theories for processing media, doing control systems and all for a variety of reasons has been in the synchronous paradigm. That is periodic signals and all just because mathematically understanding them is a lot easier. On the other hand, I guess you could uh, Imagine doing all, fix all these things uh, in a non-periodic framework, but then uh, we don't really have a kind of mathematical framework to properly reason about that. That's one. The other thing is, a nice thing about periodic time period is I don't have to carry the time stamp. The period, and then I'm done. Whereas if things are happening, if, if I were to sample uh, things non-periodically, then I'll have to carry the time stamp in front of me somehow, and that can actually Fritter away all the advantage. In fact, uh, I mean, last time I had mentioned the sub Nyquist sampling thing. So, the problem with sub Nyquist sampling is that if they, many of them go into the say, sampling at random times, or then they have to somehow carry that additional information. And let's say if your time has the same number of bits as your sample, then reality has a lot more. But let's see, right? right there, you have lots of factors, right? I mean, it's just using a lot more. So, uh, so your sampling rate. Gain, uh, sampling rate has to reduce by a significant amount before you break even, and then it kind of um, needs to uh, come out. So, so uh, periodic data streams are therefore extremely common. Both I mean, the mathematical theories exist and the issue of the time stamp. Uh, asynchronous workloads, that happens mostly because there are phenomena which are truly asynchronous. You can't predict them. Uh, and therefore, both these things, if you um, sort of are part and parcel of the workload, and uh, uh, somehow sort of good support for both ends up being uh, part of most systems. Uh, so, some common ways of programming embedded systems at different scales. I've heard some of these things. I guess uh, you would either uh, do it uh, only on low end systems, and in some cases, they call you really, really need this. So a very common one is single program. No OS, I or something. Yeah, the OS is nothing but part of the framework. And I'm kind of really scheduling each and every function of the program in some order. Oftentimes these systems as you see are organized as a set of functions which I want to call in some order. Okay, it's called a different schedule, and then I just repeat. Okay, it's a very kind of hardwired in the logic of the application as to how you are uh, so many systems are like this, many deterministic systems are like this, embryonics and cars and all these often see this. Asynchronous, um, a very common framework is the so-called foreground background framework. And what you would see is that uh, uh, these are organized limited the way processor are not. Processor arrive uh, I said in a short while ago, so uh, really have kind of two modes. You know, it has Interrupt, 
when the interrupt comes, you are interrupting what was happening so far, and uh, it's almost as if you are running on for a short while and on different functions. And you come out of it, and the control copies back to what you're running, and that whatever was previously running starts as if, other than maybe a little bit of slowdown, you know, like scrolls and restarted. So the first order it doing is so the background is the stuff that is constantly running and foreground is the interrupt. So anytime the interrupt comes, you kind of drop into this interrupt context and you come out. So conceptually, what I have really, if I can carefully work with it, is I have two things happening in parallel. I can have one program running and then I can have the other program uh, the stuff which is happening in the interrupt. A generalization of that then becomes multi thread and the thread becomes. So some of the key concepts that uh, will come out here again are exactly the one which we saw, event versus threads, concurrency versus parallelism. So um, a bit of a philosophical, uh, maybe you have thought about it or not, but uh, if you think in terms of software modules and how they relate to each other. So a very common one we see is that looking at like functions, right? I mean, I am in one component, a function, and then I need to relate to the other component. So what happens in the function call is that I do some sort of a call, I start at the beginning of this other piece of code, and then this piece of code will return, and there'll be multiple return points, but to a special case, you can say all the right ones are the right? So if I need to return from the middle, I just jump to the end and return. So I always start, finish, and then come back out. And um, uh, there's a lot of uh, behind the scenes go on uh, to make this happen, but the key part here is that the processors themselves provide some sort of a mechanism so that you can go back to where you came from. Uh, so usually uh, it would be done either via an explicit saying jump to the address which is stored in my stack, or then maybe even just uh, mnemonic for it, like return to something which does something to me. So, so that's, uh, it's, it's a very hierarchical thing. The key to keep in mind out there is that even though these are multiple software modules, at any given point in time, I'm only doing functions. So it's entirely secret. Uh, even if you were to give me multiple processor ports, I can only keep one of them after at any given time. On the other hand, our uh, threads or processes or whatever you want to call them, and they have a very symmetric model of concurrency. They are, uh, What's, what's happening is they each are like a program which are running, and once in a while they kind of exchange stuff. And if I'm lucky, I can actually keep all of both of them active all the time. So if I truly did have multiple processors, I can map each process to its own processor, and they uh, speed up. I don't have to do that multiple times. So in theory, at least, if I have more hardware, I can kind of benefit from this kind of organization by mapping each thread to its own hardware. Now, of course, life doesn't always um, uh, work in our favor. So uh, in this regard, so what may happen is at say various point in time, like I'm waiting for something, so like this thread B may reach this message earlier than this thread delta, or this thread reaches, so then I have to wait, and my processor is like idle, and so I have to kind of deal with that. Particularly with external events, that may be the case. So you probably in general would have multiple threads mapped to the same processor uh, to avoid wasting your hardware. If you think of the so-called hardwired design, the type we do at DE, that literally is a thread. Like you can think of an AND gate as a thread, it's just a AND gate. All the time it's waiting for a new input, and whenever a new input comes, it calculates the AND and comes up with the output, and it keeps always repeating that. Uh, so you can think of a dedicated hardware conceptually as Algorithm running on its own piece of hardware. But there are other models also, and one which is uh, at least uh, you are uh, maybe not taught, but it does exist in, uh, uh, in languages, and Go is like that, the one you have mentioned, uh, and that is a coroutine model. So the way coroutine works is that it has flavors of both, but it's kind of just in the middle. So, uh, I have these two coroutines A and B. At some place, A will make some thing. Uh, we're calling it resume. And the idea is that 
when I say resume tree, so unlike call trees where I always hit enter at the top, when I say resume tree, the first time I will start at the top, but the next time I will start where B had explained. So in this case, what's happening is A has started working, it said resume tree. So this is the first time, so the B will start at the top. Somewhere along the way, it says resume A. And when it says resume A, then instead of starting from the top, it will look into it, start from this particular resume. Now, if you think about it, to do that, I had to remember where A is written, right? And likewise, I have to return, remember where B had written, so I need to return. And so I resume B, continue, uh, uh, sorry, so, uh, after it says resume A, I come out here, proceed, I have to write say resume B, then that will go back to that place where we were looking for the So, uh, how many, how many things am I doing here? It's still sequential, right? So it's still sequential, mm -hmm. but it has kind of a symmetric architecture. Uh, you know, there's no hierarchy of them. Both are equal coordinates, essentially, right? Because of this property that wherever they were, so, uh, that's where we are deriving that. Okay. So you could imagine that at this point, it's kind of like saying, I give up. I need some resource, and wherever it's ready, I'm going to restart from there. So it has that property that a thread does. A thread waits for something, it gives control back to the OS, and then the control comes back exactly there. The same thing happens, okay. Uh, so it has that style of programming kind of beginning to look like that. But at the same time, since only one thing is happening at any given point, I don't have a single stack. I can share a single stack across these two things. So this core routine leads to lightweight things. Right? So if I were if I had threads or processes, I need since these guys are running in parallel, two weeks in parallel, uh, I need separate threads for this. Uh, sorry, separate stacks for this. Whereas with core routines, I can get away with a single stack, so for the challenge environment, this works great. Uh, I don't have to worry about, oh, how much stack should I give to this entity, look to that entity, I have a single uh, stack. And yet, unlike some routines, I'm not limited to always kind of starting from the top. One another way of thinking about this is the following. I can fake core routines to a function if I could attach a state to the function. Right? Because what can happen is that if I could attach the state, then the function could remember where it is written last. And then at the very top, it can have a jump to that place. Right? So you need a function with a state. Yes, sir? I mean, you call resume is the context of the thread calling. Again? You said they share the stack, but the context has to be saved in the same. So is that the chunk of the bottom of the stack? Uh, yeah, so the context has to be saved separately in some state space. Okay, not on the stack. You can't store it on the stack. Okay. Um, so it has a thread like programming style, and yet a sequential, sequentiality which is like constant. So it leads to kind of like lightweight threads, lightweight in the sense that. I have a single stack and different things, and I can actually, if I had function plus a state, I can fake core routines using that. I need one more thing. I need a way to say here, I need to be, uh, be able to save the location into a variable, that's a state variable, and then jump to that variable. Okay? Uh, this is called computed goal. That is, so in languages like C, you can't do that easily because there's no way for you to say jump to a variable. And likewise, I cannot put uh, a label into a variable. Okay. There's an exception to it. GCC allows it, but it's not standard C. Um, but there are ways to fake this thing. And uh, the way sort of, so core routines sort of obviously have been known and around, but the way of faking these things in the, um, uh, C and C like languages and all was something which was kind of discovered at a lab at the time and then kind of took in the libraries and all of this. So, you will see these kind of things like proto threads and these kind of things, which were basically uh, ways of uh, creating things which look like threads, but they're really proto -seed. So they give you the nicety of programming with threads, which are obviously separate, and yet efficiencies of uh, uh, efficiencies of, uh, uh, of 
fall back or they don't uh, And go for the, the four or eight and go are exactly kind of this. So they are very efficient, very lightweight, and they're going to have lots and lots of memory. Uh, and for other uh, languages and all, there are these library packages which kind of fake uh, through some some compiler or language mechanism. Okay, so so broadly those sort of three ways. Uh, that kind of okay. Let's take an example. Let's say we want to do something where the, um, the, uh, the bunch of happening. There is a clock text which comes every second, um, and whenever the clock text comes, you need to do some tasks. Uh, you're running a controller in a simple loop manner, so every 40 milliseconds you want to run a control module. And then you have some other stuff which is not time constrained, which has only this which may be used in the software, so we can use things like handling human input, doing screen output, logging error logs, and stuff like that and all. So there are many different ways you can proceed with this thing. A simplest way, I mean you could do this thing with uh, bare board controller would be in an infinite loop, and then uh, I know my clock module has the highest uh, need, runs every 20 milliseconds. So, what I'll do is I'll say, wait for the clock, and every time I'm going to do the clock module. And then I'm going to somehow save some state, and I'll say, okay, can I do the control? Is it like, let's say, the even number clock state? And then, if, if I'm, I may be doing the odd number clock state, I'm going to do that other non zero time. And if you think about it in this particular case, I just have to make sure that the time that the clock module takes, plus the maximum of the time that any one of these other takes is less than 20 minutes. Right? Uh, uh, I don't need any OS and all. Problem out here is that some of these things like display and operator input and all, it's going to be some long session. And uh, so it would be hard for me to fit into this because I have this requirement. So that may mean that I may have to break these functions into the subparts and then manually start saying, like, do part one, now do part two, and I'll remember someplace where am I and where I am in that chain. So a lot of stuff which OS is supposed to do for you is now one you have to do manually. Um, it could be that I uh, read a sensor sample and then uh, that sensor sample has to go through some long computation. Now imagine having to split that FFT just because you have the standard requirement. It becomes very messy. Uh, so this kind of approach, while uh, just uh, great for simple, simple stuff, just doesn't just doesn't uh, scale. This is another example. Okay. So uh, conceptually, what's happening is that uh, each one of those functions I'm calling is kind of like a task, but I do have this very tight timing constraint because I have when I give control to a task, I have to return, uh, I, it will, I have to let it run, okay, uh, because of a function and until the function returns, I, uh, um, uh, I, I cannot uh, continue. So my timing is very constrained. Uh, on the other hand, it's very simple because I just, I don't need any special way of multiplexing across uh, the hardware. I need a, a standard stack will work. So it's extremely lightweight in terms of its realization. But because of this limitation that long running stuff I'll have to split, um, uh, that leads to kind of other common organization which is foreground background system. And they work great uh, before most processors will have it. All processors have it. Um, so you can think of interrupt as a foreground mode. Whenever the interrupt comes, I stop doing what I currently want, and I handle that. Uh, so in this particular case, I can make the clock module the uh, uh, clock and control module, which are my real-time stuff, uh, to be uh, interrupt attached to some sort of a time. So every time the timer happens, I will uh, run the clock module always. And optionally, depending upon uh, which process you're doing, or take or not, I'll do the control. And it will return from the interrupt handler, and then uh, my background program will simply be a while loop where I'm just doing this non zero time stuff. Okay, so the long running stuff goes into this background task, and uh, it's not 
Yes, for example, maybe there are control modules. Uh, maybe there might be some sensor sampling modules. And it will read the sensor data, it will put it into a queue, and then out here in the background, I'm going to do that processing. Maybe I need to collect lots of sensor samples, do an FFT or whatever. So what the sampling module will do is put them into a queue and the process. So basically the interrupt is kind of handles all of the pausing your functions for you. Interrupt handles the context switch because that's what it is designed to do. And uh, it gives me a separate context as if it's a separate processor. Um, yeah, and uh, interrupt also uh, is where you shove all your real time stuff in it because the time works all those things. So there's a very, again, it's a paradigm you'll find for a bit. And my family constraints have currently been around constraints around the handler. That is, T1 plus T2 should be less than 30 milliseconds so that I'm ready for the next input in a timely manner. Uh, but, um, and of course, uh, there should be some slack out there so that there is some time, some shade of the processing that's going on in that little task. So, three those things. Okay, so uh, I mentioned earlier tiny OS, additional examples of even uh, embed SDK. They're all examples. Your real time stuff, the one which is interacting with the physical world or with the tangible shape, all will be some form of interrupt handler. And then the stuff which can potentially take a long time and all, you put them into this outer. Uh, look, and, uh, this is one way of organizing it. The other way is also it could be um, that these modules inside the interrupt handler can generate a software interrupt, and then they can go into a queue, and then you take the next element of the queue processor. So uh, there are a variety of these systems which can which exist which do this, but it's a very common paradigm to sort of organize software. So foreground background systems. Uh, yeah, I, I think let's stop out here. Uh, uh, thanks up, but we are going to pick that up. Office hours start at 4 30. I'll, today I'll just do it for one hour. Okay, I'm tired of 8 p.m. office hours. <laughs> so, um, okay, so uh, if your project is still not fully defined, just come on.